kidding me? What's up, rotters? Feliz Navi dead. Welcome back to the podcast that takes a deep dive into the best worst horror films of the 80s and 90s. I'm Stevie, your VHS veteran. I hope you're all doing horrendously. This is the final episode of season two of Brain Rot. Holy shitbags. I decided back in January to utilise my pandemic-induced spare time to put my passion to good use, and so with next to no preparation, I just jumped headfirst, recorded an episode of a, a potential podcast, and just put it out there. And in the 10 months since, this, this show has grown beyond my wildest dreams. Um, what began as a passion project to curb my anxiety and give me some focus and purpose has become a community. Uh, Brain Rot has sat at number one on the Apple Podcasts TV and film charts several times. I've hosted a live screening event. It's gathered thousands of faithful listeners and its reach extends to dozens of countries. And so before we get started with today's episode, I just want to say thank you. And I mean that from the bottom of my cold heart. I can confirm there will be season 3 of Brain Rot coming next year, but there will be more of a break between now and then than I did with season 1 and season 2, so probably looking at summer 2022. I will of course be continuously dropping regular new episodes out on Patreon with an array of awesome guests. So if you'd like to keep rotting between now and summer, just head to patreon.com forward slash Stevie's Brain Rot. Now then, since we opened the season with Elijah Wood, I thought it would be cute to close out with some equally exciting guests. Firstly, he's back on the show after discussing the slimy 80s creature feature Slugs. Back on season one, it's the one and only Stephen Fry. And joining him is Hollywood funny man Joel McHale. Since starring together in the CBS sitcom The Great Indoors, they've become my favourite new double act. And... When the opportunity came along, I immediately knew what I wanted to make them watch, the infamous Troll 2. Stephen, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me. No, (laughs) not you yet. I haven't got to you yet, Joel. (laughs) Stephen, how how are you, Stephen? Welcome to Joel's world. I'm very well, thanks. And so is Joel. Uh, Yes, I was going to say, you brought a friend with you. uh, We have unfinished business. He he only has to hear an English accent and... uh, he has a, it, it triggers him, yeah. Yeah, well, Stevie, thank uh, you know, Stephen, Stephen, and I are, are so busy with the great indoor schedule that uh-huh. uh, we barely <laughs> had time for today. So, thank you uh, for accommodating our schedule. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm pick, picking up on something there. And um, no, that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, now, we're going to obviously be talking about Troll, but before we... Troll 2, sorry. Yes, we should definitely talk about how uh, you rob or you're in the home from Beetlejuice. And uh, I just want to say it's really cool. What a tribute. Yeah, thank you. No, team. absolutely. That's what it's modeled on. Well spotted. Very good. Yeah, it's very like, good. Uh, you're in London, right? I sure am. And that's how you screwed up the time? <laughs> let's let's say that's what it was yeah didn't you guys like invent track time. Time? like it runs right through the fucking middle of your country it literally says greenwich mean time right <laughs> named it after a fucking town <laughs> yeah that's but no that that's fair enough and um well technically at the moment we're on british summertime so maybe that is the fuck that Brilliant. although that's one hour difference not the 24 hours that I fucked up and thought we were recording tomorrow. Uh, it was so funny getting a series of texts from Sir Stephen Fry going, Oh, excuse me. Um, Stevie is, uh, he, I don't think he said that. that. Uh, he no, thought, excuse me. You know how polite I am. I, I am deeply disorganized. I mean, I am dyslexic and uh, ADHD and I cannot keep track of anything. And Stephen knows this. And uh, so right. it sounds like we're kindred spirits. At some yeah, point, well, I will, we will talk about Troll too. But yes. 
<laughs> First, uh, we should talk about your relationship with horror, the horror genre generally, Joel. Yes. Who is me. driving this podcast? Oh, no, please. You, t- you two go, well, I thought you were no, ignoring I- me earlier. No, yeah. Do you like horror films? No. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I've never seen any. No, uh, they're fine. Uh, I've seen they're a lot. They're fine? Of- uh, I've seen a lot of Steven's work, so uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. come on. I saw Viper Vendetta; he was great in that. Uh, I uh, well, what's my relationship to horror films? Um, my the first one I ever saw was uh, The Shining as a child, mm-hmm. uh, wow, which what? was probably not great. Um, <laughs> and then, um, as a second grader, we there are uh, my friend Jason Cusack, whose dad was a uh, FBI agent who helped catch the Green River Killer up in uh, Seattle, Gary wow. Ridgeway. Yeah, he was uh, for real. And uh, wow. uh, we would barricade, we would have a sleepover. Uh, it was all the boys from my Catholic school. And we, uh, a few times, would, so we watched Motel Hell. Which, yes! Uh, I loved and still love. And, to, and there's a filmmaker named Scott Derrickson who is a, very close friend of mine, and we tried to buy the rights for it to remake it, and they would not sell them to us. What? No. And Scott right. Erickson, he directed fucking Doctor Strange. Right. And they're like, yeah, no, we're gonna we up we up plans for this 1980 oh. uh, semi like disco soundtrack, but very. Have you ever seen it, Stephen? Fry. Oh, me? Sorry, sorry, Stephen. No, I haven't. Motel. Motel. Hell. Motel. Hell. Hell. It's about yeah. this uh, this couple that uh, well, they basically serve people. They um they have a booby trap set up on a lonely yes. highway, and then they they take the people from the cars, they bury them up to their necks in their yeah. in their cornfield, and then they mesmerize they to soften the meat, they mesmerize them and give them drugs, and then they put nooses all around their necks, and with a tractor break all their necks it's at once horrible. and turn them That's into beef. Yeah, turn them into beef jerky. And the um, one of the most terrifying masks that well, the pig head that he wears in that is just I think it's absolutely yeah. terrifying. The, uh, uh, the 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 climax fight scene is the beef jerky maker wearing a bulletproof pig's mask mm-hmm. with a chainsaw fighting a cop with a shotgun, but it's in a meat locker with human beings all skinned. And I was just like, <laughs> as kids, we were yeah. I love that. I love how it went from um, what's your relationship with horror? Uh, don't don't watch it. And then you know every beat of Motel Hell. <laughs> oh, I love that movie. And then I think the net, the only I saw, the first Friday 13th I saw was 3D, the number, th- number, the number yeah, yeah, three, yeah. which was just kids, like teenagers having sex and then just like a knife coming up through their chests. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, especially if you see it out of 3D, everything just doesn't work because it just, everything points at the camera. <laughs> but I was saying to Stevie, when we talked about slugs, my first, uh, in my initiation into this world, um, <laughs> it is extraordinary how adolescent love is punished in all these movies. It's always mm-hmm. a, a young couple making out in a park or on a boat and you know yeah, they're going to be pulled down into the water. Yeah. Somebody's going to leap over them. It's, it's as if there's a moral message coming from the filmmakers to say We're don't quite, have yeah. sex. Which there is. is. Naughty, it's naughty. A, it's a yeah. Puritan message. It's yeah. like anything premarital, you're going to be, you're in trouble. And speaking of those early slashes, Joel, did you know, actually, you have uh, a connection to a very classic horror film. Am I right in thinking that at one point you lived in Haddonfield? Yes, I did. Because that's the Haddonfield that Halloween was based on. Good Lord. Was was it based on Haddonfield, New Jersey? Yeah, it was. So there isn't, it's fictional Haddonfield, Illinois in the the film. But basically, Deborah Hill, who wrote and produced it, she was from Haddonfield, New Jersey. Oh, which is and a, where did they, and they shot it in because it's all the, autumnal. It's a beautiful, isn't it? Jamie Lee Curtis yeah. kicking the autumn leaves, the fall yeah, leaves. Yeah, yeah. It's very beautiful, sort of. The more it makes suburbs look like heaven, the more well, the yeah. hell that breaks out, doesn't it? And that that yeah. that was sort of something John Carpenter started in some ways, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. That's suburbia, okay. Yeah, yeah. We lived here for two years. It's a Dutch reform town, and it's. It was beautiful, and uh, and then my parents didn't like the way we were talking uh, because of our Philadelphia accents, and so we moved, <laughs> moved to Seattle, where you know serial killers were actually operating. The real ones, yes, <laughs> yes quite, right. fantastic. Um, well, 
Uh, on to something a, le- a little less real life now. So we're going to talk about Troll 2, which has absolutely nothing to do with the first film Troll. That's why I didn't mention it. Did, I also want to point out that Stephen Fry, who has written 10 books, I pointed this out <laughs> while we were watching. He was like, 10 books. He's uh, written musicals. He's He's been nominated for like six British Academy Awards. He's got Golden <laughs> Globes coming out of his butt. And, we, and I turn on Troll 2. And I was just like, some this that somewhere like God is going like I gave that guy that brain, I gave him that brain, and now he's watching Troll Two. <laughs> you guys actually watched troll. it together, right? We did. We watched it together. Um, yeah, we discovered because we thought we would do a bit of background research. Yeah, what you said that it is nothing to do with trolls and it's nothing to do with Troll One. It, it's no. just extraordinary. As I understand it, a group of Italian filmmakers yes. came up with the script, such as it was, in Italian, mm-hmm. moved to Utah, to sort of Park City, you know, the land of <laughs> South Park. And there they right. found local people whom they offered parts to play in their film, and somebody translated it into Russian and then into Serbian and then into Welsh and then back into Italian and then into English. Apparently, yes. it seems at least. Yeah, and uh, the result is this extraordinary, catastrophic <laughs> movie. I mean, and we also discovered, but you'll tell us more about this. That it, it is bad enough to have had a movie made about it. Uh, that the the only good actor in the entire film is the, is the ten eleven year old kid, the boy. Yeah. He, he's far better than any of the adults, and I gather he made a film called. Oh come on! Best- I think the dad. I think the dad is really good. <laughs> Stop it! The dentist. The dentist. We, we haven't dad come to the poor good. witch yet, have we? But um, it, it, yeah. Uh, and he made this film called The Best Worst Movie. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, it's a feature length as a film. It's a better film than Troll Two. Yeah, yeah, like, like the Room and the Disaster Artist, I suppose. Oh, yeah. yeah. I uh, read a thing about the documentary and uh, Ebert said it was the one of the best documentaries of that year. Right. So who would have <laughs> thunk it? I, there's a really good article in Dig, uh, which is the oral history of Troll 2, and they interview all the actors. Uh, Brad Stevens turned me on to it, and it's so interesting reading the accounts of the actors and of the wife of the director, Right. Who clearly is proud and pissed uh, about people saying it's the worst movie and hate, like, really resents the actors for saying it's terrible. Yeah. And it's, it's for those who haven't seen it, only just to give you obviously, the ideal thing is to be in California or maybe Portugal or the Netherlands and spark <laughs> up a joint or drop an edible or two before watching it. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and you will have a great time with your friends because it is so appalling that it will force itself into your memory and, and, and never leave. Uh, yeah, and uh, so you might as well make it positive experience. But Stephen and Stevie, would you agree there is sure. a peculiarity to it that is makes it bizarrely watchable i i that's what this whole podcast is about those films that border on uh, they tipped over the line between being so bad that they are good yeah because like when i saw episode one of star wars in the 90s that Mm. was i'm sure steven's friends with most of the actors from it but uh but that was like you know insanely disappointing but it gets to this point where you're just kind of bored and I'll never be in a George Lucas film now, but that <laughs> this movie doesn't necessarily have the boredom factor. No, that's right. That is the magic of it. It's, I guess because you're, you, some other part of your brain is awake, constantly aware of the astonishing nature of such a disaster of how they could have set up the shot like that, how they could choose this color for the chlorophyll coming out of the wigs or the running down their eyes almost every choice is so spectacularly misjudged that that it makes one more aware and alert and fascinated and sympathy i mean there is a central performance from a young woman playing a sort of witch character (laughs) that is so appallingly bad i mean it's embarrassing you your skin crawls your bowels bubble all kinds of things go wrong with you physically just having to watch this 
poor woman yeah. who might have been encouraged into doing it and as an amateur may well have thought before it came out this you know i might get offered work i might i might become an actress yes and, yes and, and maybe her friend saw it with her and said gosh well done honey and and then slowly bits of report would come in and presumably being beastly about it and well yeah so i'm I, sure i felt a kind of I think you did, Joel, Joel, as well. We mentioned a kind of awful wave of sympathy for her because yeah, I, and then and I read that dig article, and the director apparently just kept going like louder, bigger, <laughs> oh. like just he, <laughs> and so there might so it is like as an actor, you're like, wait, is, is what's happening? I feel so. Oh no, what's happening? This is terrible. <laughs> yeah. and well, we all we all know as actors that that when you first do a film, most of us will have started on stage in one way or another because that's the easiest way to start, and and it takes a bit of learning to bring your performances down for the camera and the microphone mm. and to be as yeah. natural as possible. And and the famous directors always say, "Stop acting and don't do that," and just no, just relax your face. <laughs> but as you say, this Italian guy was going and Cora and Cora more more. <laughs> Yeah. And apparently he was um because he and his wife, as you said, they they wrote it together and they do not speak English. So it was a broken English script. But Shocking. they were so precious Yeah. <laughs> but they were so <laughs> precious about it, they wouldn't let any of the performers correct any of the grammar or the, the sort of bizarre sentences. They were like, no as it's written. So that's why a lot of it comes out the way it does. And this character you're talking about, uh, Credence Leonor Gielgud, of all names. Wow. Um, that's her real name? No, that's the character. Oh, that's the character name. Yes, right. So, yeah. But it's, it, uh, it's so, as you say, heightened and ridiculous. It's like the, the awkwardly eccentric history teacher at school around Halloween time, when you're just like, oh, stop it. And just being, Wah-ha-ha, come into the classroom. Yeah. yeah. Oh God, doing his Dracula accent. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Is. That made me uncomfortable, Stevie. And, you're, and you're of course, crazy. it's also it's not as if it's a, a completely original way of doing it. It's just the same old tropes of all the horror films. It's yeah. You know, family yeah. goes on holiday into the woods. We've been told the woods are dangerous. The goblins live there, and nonetheless, they go. And uh, the, the daughter has a boyfriend who's got his tongue hanging out. For yeah. Him. Yeah. Uh, and you you instantly know which ones are going to die, which ones will be mm-hmm. absorbed by the evil, which ones will survive. You know the little boy will survive. You know, you know, you know. And I, so, yeah. in that sense, it's it's, it's a well trodden path. But it just shows that there's always a new way to do something really badly. <laughs> I read also that I think the entire cast actually went to the casting call hoping to be extras to get a job as an extra, and then they were given the lead parts. And in fact, there's one. There's one guy, and his name is Don Packard. It's his real name. He plays the convenience store owner, the really sort of, uh, for want of a better word, crazy one. And uh, so the actor that was cast for, <laughs> for that role didn't turn up. And so this guy who played it, Don Packard, was actually a patient at a nearby mental hospital who was out on a day trip that they... <laughs> Gave the role to, and uh, I'm not. I'm not laughing at mental health. I'm laughing at the audacity. No, well, no of the but situation. that also suggests a fabulous plot, doesn't it? Of a of a of a, of a sort of day for night or Rafifi type uh, slasher or horror movie, which right. is about the making of a horror movie in which they that exactly that happens. They cast someone from a hospital, and that person they cast is a slasher killer. And it goes they, and kills everyone. This meta yeah, they sort of think he's doing the scene really well, and how yeah. well the special effects blood is working, and then they discover it's real blood. Whatever. And yes. uh, when, he, when he got back to the mental hospital, he was like, "Yeah, that Italian guy's crazy." <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't believe what they're trying to pull off. <laughs> um, I have to just say, what I think one of my highlights is. When they, they get to Nilbog and the family, they're about to just chow down on some of the green food, which no one ever questions this green food, why it's green or what it is. And uh, the, the grandpa says, oh, I'll give you 30 seconds to stop them eating it. And he clicks. So time stops. That's right. Oh, <laughs> and watching, running. yes, watching them all try and act like time has stopped. But they have not helped them at all. One, of, one guy's got a a kernel of corn which has loads of string hanging from it so that's waving someone's got a glass of actual liquid to their mouth why not and all the jelly? are shaking and yes moving and you see their eyes twitch so and the girl blinks fully blinks <laughs> and if the grandpa if the grandpa who is a ghost yeah you know, 
he can disappear. Yeah, he appears in a mirror, doesn't he, in the only match shot of the thing, the only actual VFX yeah, yeah. moment, I think. He yeah. could have helped out so many people by stopping time. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, only that once. It's a fantasy we've all had, let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But also there's a, an awkward moment when the, the boy stops them on the way there anywhere because he saw the grandpa outside and he's talking to him. And then it turns out it's actually a homeless guy he's talking to and he just imagined it was the grandpa, which begs the question, is there just a strange man following him around that he keeps thinking is his grandfather? Phoebe, I'm going to stop you there. It does not beg the question almost on anything okay. uh, with this movie. I'm, I'm not, I, it's, I don't know. Wrong Ted, what to te- you know, it'd be like being on the Lusitanian going like, it does beg the question uh, whether what it does it beg a belief. Blown up. <laughs> I mean, you're you're asking a sensible question about where the, what were they driving at with this? Was it that the he just saw that he imagined the? Uh, I don't think that was that at any point was thought out. Right. Yeah. Fair enough. But the boy pisses all over his family. That's that. That's that's an extra, yeah, He literally pisses on them. It's quite extraordinary. And then they sort of suggest that the dad's going to do it back because yes. he, he, he starts to... As his punishment. Then, Wait, I'll yeah. show you. <laughs> I've, I've, I have two boys and I've done that. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah? Like, well, watch this. Dad just had some asparagus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, you also forget that they were all Mormons. Not forget, but they were all... So all the Italians were like drinking wine and smoking, and they were right. like, I, I read the thing from the girl doing the the weights, the, the 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 teenager wearing like the leotard. She was like, I had never kissed anyone, and then the first time it happened was on screen. Man, oh I wow! Like, oh. I actually had that. I I had that once when I was I was about eighteen, but I I I always looked younger than I was, so I was playing a fourteen year old on a, a TV show and um, I had to be kissing this uh, schoolgirl <laughs> in it basically. And uh, there was lots of classroom making out and the teacher catching us. And just before the first take, when we had to really go for it, I, I said, um, have you done this before? And she said, no. And I went, oh, me neither. And I was talking about kissing on screen. Uh, she was talking about kissing. Uh, and then she made it clear that this was going to be her first kiss. And then, they called action and I just I just got this information and I went I was bright red it was very awkward and she's now called Sister Maria and she lives in a convent (laughs) and (laughs) well that's yeah wow Mm. I'm also reminded of the the girl playing the witch I don't know why it does sort of prey on my mind I'll change the names here it is a good story but a very sad story I was at a party in America once and someone said to me um that see that girl over there don't mention that you're here to do a film and that you're to do with the film business I said okay and then on the journey back I said why wasn't I allowed I spoke to the girl she's very nice why couldn't I speak about the movie business and they said well uh Kevin Costner came to town to make a picture and um, she was passionate about acting and she asked if she could be an extra. And she was given a part where she came uh, and she sat on a sofa in, at a party scene and Kevin Costner himself was to sit next to her and look across at her and she would see him looking and then he would lean forward and just grab a bowl of peanuts that was on the arm next to her and then take it round and then eat it and then go off into his plot. And that was her mm-hmm. moment. Anyway, she did it, and uh, she felt it was okay, and her friends came to the premiere, which in the town was the, pr- the premiere of the film, because it had been shot in this town, which I won't mention, because it would give it away. Okay. Um, and you're probably thinking, oh, she was cut from the movie. No, it wasn't that at all. She was in the movie. It was all fine. It was just that the, the title credits, she was listed as Plump Simple Girl. <sighs> And she uh, ran from the cinema in tears and never wanted to hear no about that film. Isn't that cruel? I mean, unbelievably cruel. And and sometimes, you know, it's, I mean, it's less true now because everybody has an experience of being on camera because of uh, the mobile phones and all the rest of it, we all know. But there was a period 30, 40 years ago when no one ever saw themselves on the screen and hadn't done. And no one had seen themselves outside a mirror reflection, in, which is mm-hmm. in real time. No one had ever seen a re- recording of themselves except, you know, Super 8 wedding pictures and things. And um, everyone thought it was the most wonderful thing in the world. But sometimes being captured forever on film is... 
is like a Dorian Gray moment of screaming. She's screaming behind that. That will never be destroyed. It will always no, be there. No. Someone will always see it. This sin is constantly in the public face, and it's a horrible thought. <laughs> Sorry to drag it down, because I know it's kind of funny, and it is funny. I was going to say, next time on uh, Edwardian <laughs> Secrets with Stephen Fry, an Audible exclusive, we explore. You actually did, because I, I listened to Victorian Secrets, and they talk about now how everyone, they have, mm. everyone has access to photo, photo, uh, photography. Yeah. It's, mm. it's the first time that people are looking at themselves and looking yeah. at others and looking at other images going like, oh, maybe that's what I want to look like. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's very common. I remember hearing a psychiatrist talk about this, that when people see themselves on film or in, on video, uh, they, sh they keep saying under their breath, stop it, stop it. They're talking to, the, to their past self, whom they cannot influence, of course, uh, uh, because that, that self is pulling a smile that the one watching doesn't like or didn't realise they looked like that. Uh -huh. smiled, you know, and, and they have to overcome all these self-image problems. But anyway, that's a sort of side <laughs> issue. But... You know, an awful film like that, because it's so markedly awful and is, you know, in most people's lists, apparently, of the, of the 10 worst movies ever made, yeah, is, yeah. is bound to make one think not just of the fact that it's kind of funny, but also that it's sad and that it, it's... Yeah, I, I, I tend, from from my experience, I tend to found, though, what's great, because of this, the VHS boom in the 80s and early 90s, and there was just this influx, especially of horror films, because they were such an easy sell and cheap to make, that um, there's no other genre like that that has created people who are just in one shitty one and actually can, if and have embraced it in later years. And, you know, people queue up to get their to get their signature from oh, this really? film, this one terrible film they did 40 years ago. And it's only horror, really, that has that, that sort of fan base. And, you know, yes, you, you get it with a lot of kung fu films, but you don't get a romantic comedy convention, do you? You no, know, it's, it's so specific. True, yeah. And um, a lot of the actors, or, or indeed people who weren't actors, but found themselves in a leading role in a B movie in the eighties, totally embrace that. And so, and I do believe a lot of the they're all on the sort of audio commentaries. A lot of the cast from this have, oh, yeah. whether they started like that or not, they've come round to yeah. seeing it as a cult classic. Yeah, there's nothing like it because the closest thing, I mean, Rocky Horror doesn't count or what's happened with Sound of Music, but that's more of a participant. That's not a fan. Mm -hmm. They're fans, of course, but that has become like a show where there's so many movies from the 80s like this and early 90s. But is it happening now? I mean, because you can make a movie on anything, but I guess there's so much content now that these get lost. Yeah, and I, th I think the difference is now, I think immediately um, the quality is automatically better yeah, on your the phone. Some, yeah, the yeah. production value is, you, you don't even have to buy, you know, it's free apps do better than that. And also, um, it, it's just a completely different aesthetic that I don't think you can fake. And, and people try, when people make a sort of 80s nostalgia horrors now, they just rely on synthesizers and neon and it doesn't have that authenticity. And I think you just can't fake, fake that. So you do get bad films now, but they're not camp yeah. bad or enjoyably bad. A bad film now is just a bad film. Just irritating. Whereas I think, yeah. yeah, it's just irritating. Where in the 80s, there's something um, endearing about them yeah. trying to be good. <laughs> I agree. I also I read a thing about the movie, how they couldn't, inc they couldn't have any blood. Uh, right. Due to, like, a, they, for Italian censor, they were trying to make a fan... Uh -huh. They were trying to make a family movie, which is also banana. <laughs> questionable. That's questionable. Because it's, I mean, just for, yeah, like the kid pissing on the family and then the dad, I mean, all that stuff is, it's not a family film. I don't even know what you would count it as, but it's. No. So Extreme much. fantasy? Is that yeah. a genre? I don't even know. But yeah, the blood, that was a big thing in Italy. A lot of, especially if you had creatures, they always made sure that the blood was either black or green because ratings wise, uh, you won't, this, and censorship, you'll get a lower rating. Of course. Yes. Well, what's weird is that, you know, like the Italian film industry was so huge in the 60s and part of the 70s and then pretty much disappeared. You didn't hear they about it. They made a lot of horror in the 80s. Yeah. 
like the, the, the sort of Italian. That's where all those, you know, the really gross zombie films came from, like with Fulci, and uh, then you got Dario Argento. So yeah, in terms well, of yes, mainstream, very mainstream, yeah, yeah. But they, but in mainstream, it wasn't so much as you say, Joel. It, it wasn't all about the Italians, but in horror, in the underground, they went, they went underground basically. Wow. That's cool. Extraordinary. Uh, you know so much about this. And um, I mean, I'm trying to picture, did they fly over from Italy with the with the goblin costumes in their luggage? Or did they have them made in Utah? These strange brown baggy, saggy things with, you know, stitched on eyes. And I mean... Yeah, well, you've got that one that's the one who was completely just... different. <laughs> this one. Yes, that one. <laughs> the wide eye. <laughs> <laughs> it's been, and I love that you can also see the human person underneath some of the masks. Yeah. And then they always put the one with the weird eyes in the front because they were up like... Some, up front this center. Is, this is the expensive one. And <laughs> yeah. they just should have... Like the other goblins should have been embarrassed by that one and just be like, oh, uh, yeah, right. this, is, this is Bill. He's... Cousin Bill. He's the one with the eyes. Uh, <laughs> does his thing. It's... <laughs> And then there's that weird priest guy who's like the oh, weird. Yeah. It's all very the cult. It, it, I think that's what one of the reasons why it's so fascinating is because the dialogue is so stilted mm-hmm. that uh, one of the actors said it like he goes, "The translation looked like Google Translate now." <laughs> but then right. the wife of the director was like, "How dare you? We had that translated by an American." And then I thought, "What American would?" talk that way maybe somebody who was in a dungeon for their entire childhood but it was a mormon child maybe oh well, it, yeah there you go. They had it done locally yes I, I, who and you steven you pointed out that yet that at that point the sundance film festival wasn't uh, i mean in 1990 it wasn't what it is today even close mm-hmm. and ironically troll 2 Shot on the streets of Park City, where where the Sundance Festival takes place. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Have you been That's there? Have you been to Sundance, Stephen? Yes. Yeah, I took. I took a film I directed. I took there actually, and it was shown there. Uh, to, to well, and well, that that was a it's called Bright Young Things, things. or was what? it Wild? It was one of those. It was a film I was involved with. In. I remember. I remember slipping on the ice because there's a sort of slope, and the, and the, and the <laughs> festival is always in winter. So um, yeah, and also it has. I mean, it's a sort of mixture of of the sort of chainsaw massacre thing where you happen on weird and frightening people in the country or a cabin in the woods or all the various subgenres of mm-hmm. horror where, where you stumble across a community or a, a, a warped group of people. But it's also got a hint of the the British uh, side of that, the um, the Wicker Man, you know, the Dennis Wheatley. The folk horror. Um, yeah, where you get Charles Gray in a white shift and the sound of Carmina Burana going, yeah. you know, <laughs> going on in the background and flames and pentangles and a bit of witchcraft. Yes. So it sort of suggests all of those things, but doesn't achieve any of them in any direction. <laughs> so in, I mean, it's, well, I uh, recommend so people you, see it you, because it's a lot more fun to watch that with a friend than, than, I don't know, some of the more earnest three-hour bloody things oh, that definitely. have to watch nowadays. It's a good, you know, it's only 90-odd minutes. It's very quick to watch. And, uh, yeah, I recommend it. <laughs> good. Yeah, I just there kept drinking wine. Uh, yeah. uh, I just kept opening up no- another bottle of wine, and I realized I was like, oh, I might not even remember this. Right. <laughs> well, you've, uh, you've both done very well. Stephen, are you going to include this in the next uh, Mythos installment? <laughs> it, it is it is a whole genre of mythology fable legend yeah absolutely allegory it's all there in that in that world uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. you, you think jo- what would joseph campbell think of this he would um i you know he called myth um, a public dream, and I, I think he would call this a public nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Nightmare is not that it's frightening; it's that is that you try hard and you all gather together to do something, and you miss by such an extraordinary distance. It's really yeah. Incredible. And holy and holy crap! Did they not care about branding? Like just like brand, like brand names appearing, like. <laughs> 
Coke. Yes. I, I, there was a Coke and then a, like for some point it was a Coke and a Mountain Dew and a shot together. <laughs> right. Which is Coke versus Pepsi, which is like, this has never <laughs> happened in film. Yes. Uh, it takes an American to see these, <laughs> these <laughs> religious heresies of being committed. It never occurred to me. That's really interesting. I, lo- I looked at the, on YouTube in the kids' room has like eight or nine different sports teams represented <laughs> in the same sport. And some of them. And they're, they're all saying like, it's a history. This kid, who is this kid? Is he the greatest sports fan of all time? And, uh, if they would have Arsenal and Spurs players on the same wall, which would be inconceivable. Right? Yeah. Oh, I've just remembered something I wanted to ask you while I've got you, Stephen, um, because I'm not—I'm certainly not a ge- geographer. But uh, Credence says that her ancestors are from Stonehenge. Now, am I yes, right I'm thinking it's—it's it's not actually an area; it is just yeah. the monument. It, and the monument, another word for that monument, is a henge, and that happens right. to be a one. Yeah. Um, so it's like saying my mum's from Statue of Liberty. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That's exactly what. Yeah. Well, like. as we know, Stonehenge is just the frame for an old house and, yeah, yeah or oh, something druidic basically it's a druid yeah. yeah oh but no. you got me from it stevie watch this uh watch this stevie hey steven can you give mm. us a one minute about stonehenge do you know anything about it <laughs> Stop oh, it. go on do it do it well, they're changing their opinions of course they did believe that the stones were taken across from wales but oh dear well, do you, Stephen's oh, do you want to own hear? voice is talking back to him. Right yeah, that was no, incredible. Actually, uh, that's he had an out of body experience. This shows yeah, you I'll, how smart he is. His own. I'll play my ringtones because I got one. I'm very proud of, which is sort of not exactly in your wheelhouse, Stevie, but it might amuse you. Sound and haptic. See if you because you've got to listen all the way to the end because you realise it's not quite exactly as you think it's going to be. Shall do. Well, this is exciting. I don't know who you are. I don't know what you want. But if you let my daughter go now, that'll be the end of it. Remember, Stephen? It's me, buddy. <gasps> oh, I, was, I got Liam. My Liam God, to do that for my phone. <laughs> Holy Isn't shit! Isn't that great? <laughs> That's wow. amazing. I oh, I'm was. jealous. <laughs> oh. Do you think but they ever my... thought you know, like he's in Schindler's List, and obviously it's an amazing performance? It's a, it's a masterpiece. And then they're like, you know, in about 20 years, you're going to be doing action <laughs> revenge films that we're just going to rename a little bit and change That's a little bit. You, I have a certain set of skills. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Sometimes it'll be on a plane, sometimes on a train. We'll just keep changing the, uh, the <laughs> where it's yeah. I mean, how many takens <laughs> are there at this point? Here's Several. my uh, text, man. This is the one that came through on the text, though. I one thing. Yes. I have no idea what that is. No, no, it's me just saying I am the one they call the bastard master. Um, well, to, to round it off, if you could uh, take... I still got time. I'm not... We're, oh, we, oh. we're going. I still got time, so... Oh, well, then go, keep talking. Go. He's enjoying Here's what I want to talk about. Go on. Uh, no, I uh, the I was the the part where the kid is slowly they I, I like how when he is growing into they, they want to grow the peat right that's right the, the witch did think ahead to go we're definitely going to use pots we need like a nice <laughs> pot that's we can't right. just I mean this has to look nice as this human being is turning that's into right. a plant that we I want to eat. How does a single goblin or troll survive? Because they're constantly, they're like, we got to get this animal or whatever it is that we got to plant it. And then it's got to turn into a plant and then we can eat it. It's It's quite a long process. It's a terrible life cycle. It really is. How does anybody live? I mean, how how does anybody like plan ahead? I mean, you have to, or that's all you do is plan ahead for meals. I guess so. But as, as you said, what's the point in the pot? And also they really go on about how meat is bad and they're vegetarians and vegetarian all the way, but they are killing humans. So w- where their stance is on being vegetarian, it's obviously not <laughs> because yes. of killing innocent animals. <laughs> We're also, of course, we live it. Uh, um, we look at these things with some puzzlement because uh, 
we live in a time now where it's almost impossible to have the same problems that people did in the 80s and in the 70s. Mm-hmm. If you think of John Carpenter, we mentioned one of his great early movies, Assault on Precinct 13. Precinct 13, yeah. It wouldn't make sense. What's so brilliant is they cut the phone wires. They yeah, cut the phone right. wires. The police precinct is completely isolated by the gang that surrounds it and, and they've got silencers and, you know, all the rest of it. And it, it's quite convincing. Uh, and similarly, this town... Um, why don't you just pick up a phone and say, excuse me, there's some strange <laughs> green people wandering about. You know, um, um, the, 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 we now live in a such, a such a safe, connected environment. It's going to cause real problems to people making horror films, isn't it? You know, They have to make yeah. them more technical horror films, like The Ring and later versions of, of, of that. Which is a yeah. Bit well, a... there's there's a there's a horror film there's a few horror films set on Zoom now. You know, it's they uh, they do keep I'll doing that. Really. But um, and I I agree with you. Um, sometimes it's done well, but I think uh, that's what I love about the '80s because there were less things to get in the way of the killer's plan. Uh, yeah. Such as, as you say, a phone line. You know, the the great when a stranger calls. It's that wonderful thing when she gets the call saying the killer's the call's coming from inside the house yeah. and that could, yeah. you know, there's, no, there's nothing on the phone there's no dial there's no screen yeah. anything like that there's nothing else you can do yeah nowadays if you try to make that movie the woman would go well yeah i can see exactly where <laughs> yes. 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 Well, I, I expected that in fact yeah. And, right yeah yeah it's coming from my ipad <laughs> And you yeah. photograph everybody, you can record them, you can, you know, yeah. it's just, it's really interesting that, isn't it? And I suppose that that is one of the things that makes the 80s the high point of this, because it's the last moment when humans could be t- pitched against other humans with no technological advantages, you know, given that, assuming they haven't got a gun, and it's mostly mm. late adolescence, so they won't have guns. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But with this, this, to be fair, this family did, decide to go to a town called Nilbog, population 26. That's their first mistake. And it's also- It's a fun vacation. It's a right, fun they... vacation area. Everyone loves it. <laughs> Families love it. They love that cafe with all the dudes in, with all the dudes in it that are staring at people. They should have yeah. gone to the Welsh village of Chort, which is troll backwards, you see, in Welsh. Oh, and then nice. they would have been friendly. But Because uh, I was going to ask you this. The, they call it Troll 2, though it has no relationship to Troll and has no trolls in it. Did they get, they didn't get sued or no one said to them, hey, you can't do that? I mean, there is no copyright in titles, I believe. So in the, I could make right. a film. But like, actually, how many Fridays the 13th are there? Because I'm going to ask there you are a 12. question. Oh, so there you are. So Friday the 13th, the 13th must be on its way. Well, we're waiting, but there is, um, it's been going on for over 10 years now, a massive yeah. rights issue about who owns the title, who owns Jason. And it's basically just uh, greedy, rich white men that um, just want, they want all the money. And so we're still waiting. I thought it was uh, that James Cameron was taking eight years to film it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wrong again. <laughs> Sounds about right. Um, yeah. But th- th- this was actually written and filmed when it was being filmed as a film called Goblins. And so then they tried to shoehorn the sort of canon of the early 80s film Troll, which it's not It's not like it was exactly a blockbuster. And I don't think it had such a fan base that warrants having to ride on its mm. coattails. But they did that a lot. And it was a very Italian horror thing to do. They... Um, they would create movie series out of existing films. So they have this this series called La Casa and it's various films, but none of them are related. But one of them's Evil Dead, which is someone else's film. Another one is a film called Witchcraft that they call La Casa 4. And they basically put them out as this (laughs) series of films, but they've taken other people's films from different countries. And this happened a lot. So they just make certain films canon that had absolutely nothing Wait, to do with it. So them. because in that Dig article, the Italian, the wife of the director was like, mm. we were forced to call it Troll 2. And which I thought, I could, you saying that sounds like it was an Italian thing, but they, her claim was that no, in America, they made us call it Troll 2, which... She had a real chip on her shoulder, you could tell mm. from the interview, because she was mad at the actors. And uh, But I, it's so interesting that you would say that. It's like, oh, it's, it was an Italian thing to do, which they did. And then she's like, we didn't do that. And I'm like, mm, maybe, maybe you did. Uh, did they go on, this couple, to make any more notable films, any better uh, movies? Or was this their last hurrah? They did a version of Watership Down. <laughs> Stop it. 
<laughs> you're, you're pulling your straight face, which means it must be a lie. <laughs> you've, only got, you've got a nine high in that hand. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I I know that he went on to do z- Zombie Four. Now this is another one. So God, the, the Zombie Flesh Eaters that we had here mm-hmm. in uh, Italy was called Zombie Two. Mm-hmm. Nice. And then, then that series continued, and then they ended up making Romero's Dawn of the Dead Zombie Which One is later on. Yes, but so he's part of that group, Romero, because he's emerged no. as a genuinely good filmmaker. Oh, I see. Oh, yeah, he's great. No, they yeah. just they just tacked they it just on, tried. and oh, they make up their own uh, film series out of other people's films, and so it's it's great, but it's ridiculous. And, and did they have the same sort of satire behind it as Romero, the the shopping mall zombie, you know, suggesting right, that that's... we are zombies and so on? No, they yeah. they're all very different. I mean, the fifth one is Zombie Five: Killing Birds, which is basically about birds that are now zombies and kill you. So wow. there's no true through line <laughs> yeah. no no are you saying that they so that, like la casa is just ripping off other films mm-hmm. like oh okay all right i see but but you they, said it was like evil dead one of them oh yeah so e, so evil dead 2 they went right that's part of this series I so they, they merely piggyback off the title not not the material yeah no the, the material yeah so oh. they they changed the name of it basically and there's, it's like they did. They made one called Cruel Jaws or Jaws Five, which isn't an official Jaws film. It's, it's a, it's a different sort of underground world. But they have people like you who are there to watch it for us. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, we have washing machines to wash our dirty clothes. We have dishwashers to wash our dirty dishes. We have Stevie to watch our dirty, well, not dirty films, our, our, but the films on our behalf. And then he unfortunately apportions the work. I, yeah. I would I would love to know a how much money the film now has made because uh, mm. like I've spent four dollars renting it and, <laughs> and I would like to know how much the actors have made from going to conventions not, not that I mean just like with the combined they're like it turns out this movie has made two hundred fifty oh, million dollars yeah. when you add up you know how it's still because it's still being talked we're talking about it yeah right now and people are still re- it's still in like it's still known yeah. I mean, you were there it's still, like my son my 16 year old was genuinely entertained he was like this is terrible but it's mm, yeah it's it's crazy but it's got to be in the hundreds of millions at this point it's been out since it's 19- got to be a lot it, I mean, the budget was sixty-five thousand. I was just about to say I was looking at IMDb so. Pro, and that like was hundred. They said it was a hundred in this Dig article because the the actors kept referring to they like when we were in the woods, it was basically camping. There was no outhouses, there was no structures, and they just right. kept on. And they would reg- like they would get pizza the night before, and then clearly the next day it was the leftover pizza from the night before oh, as man. they <laughs> as a meal. Well, I wonder, does it say anything about how much it made, Stephen? It doesn't. It has the budget, and then, I mean, I can look at different territories. Is the budget 65000 yeah, That's what it says here, yeah. But it actually says the weekend gross, well, it's got $527. Uh, <laughs> as, as it's, that's its average by theatre. It's ranked 90th. But that's in week one of April and April 2021 for some bizarre reason. So I... Uh, let's have a look. Oh, I'll look at all now. Well, it's blah, 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 blah. the most it made was six hundred dollars in one year, <laughs> and then, it's going, then it goes down. Yeah, but but what's nice is that it's it's got five hundred and forty-one news articles about it, and there you go. It, it's you know only nine. It's up. You know, it's nine thousand seven hundred eight on the movie meter, which um, that's to say, number one is the best, and then you know the. the Disregarded Ooh. films are so. It's, and it, you know, there are a lot more than ten thousand movies in the world. It, well, exactly. You know. Wouldn't you much rather make one of the shittest films ever than be than, than a, a mediocre film? Yeah, I would rather. Yeah, I've been in a lot of films that nobody. I <laughs> <would> see. <laughs> I'm looking it up on Box Office Mojo to see if. Uh, oh, Box Office Mojo. That's, I, 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 one can't be offended by a film like that. You know, because it's trying, and it, whereas mm. movies with huge amounts of money that screw it up, 
um, you can that, yes. cross with, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Or misjudgments. I've been reading and thinking, feeling so sorry for Ben Platt because everybody's been going on and on about Dear Evan Hansen and how mm-hmm. he's let the whole film down and it's he is a, you know, and I was thinking, how can you cope with Oh, for that goodness kind of sake. Yeah. Meanness, you know. Yeah, no, it's, it's the pressure it, of it. it. That's one of those things that catches fire and then people pile on. Uh-huh. And. Yeah. Uh, and and it just becomes that becomes the narrative instead of the film, as opposed to something like Keanu Reeves had a like an uh it was, it was an assat like a forget what it was uh, it was a Ronin like Ronin Seven or something yes called, yes or Seven Ronin which was a gigantic huge budget film came you know like December like Christmas release or something and and it nothing you know and it and it it just disappeared. And you don't you don't hear about those flops. Uh, it just was uh, as as opposed to like remember before Titanic came out, they were talking about they're like it's way over budget, it's a disaster, it's a yeah. it's, it's going to be a true uh, just a bu- there's no way, and then that just erased. But it's interesting, like it's sad for something like that, Evan Hansen, because great, obviously mm. great musical, but mm. just, well, it's. It's what we were talking about. Like you just said, it, you know, the way it catches fire. It's because of what we have in our pockets and what we have in our hands. You know, it yeah. used to be that you have to seek out reviews or, you know, you'd see a trailer on TV yeah. maybe and that's all you got of a film. You'd have to take a punt. And in the VHS era, especially with the horror, like films like this, oh, yeah. there was no way of accessing yeah. a trailer. You couldn't you couldn't pop online and find a review. You just had to take a punt. And the, you know, distributor had to catch your eye with that awesome cover art. And so... It's you had to find out for yourself if it was shit, not just suddenly hear it, process the information, then make that decision in your own head before even actually seeing it. Yeah. And as you say, Joel, it just goes off and then it's it's gone. It's too late. It's spread. I, I remember my friend Nick and I, we went and saw Ishtar before the reviews <laughs> came out. And we walked out of there and there were I was like, a masterpiece, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. Yeah. It <laughs> is one of the funniest fucking things I've ever seen. And then it was then the reviews were like Dustin Hoffman's career over. You know? right. and- <laughs> Whereas actually the first 40 minutes of it is brilliant. It does totter a bit, I think, towards the end, but I'd recommend anybody go and watch this stuff because it is one mm-hmm. of the names of, that is repeated as a dire warning. It doesn't matter how talented the filmmakers, you know, Elaine May, one of the greatest comedy writers in yeah. history and, and Dustin Hoffman, one of the greatest film actors, but and Warren Beatty, obviously a great producer, director and actor himself. And, and, um, uh, but it isn't that. I laughed so hard, and uh, I was just like, "Let's." I mean, I even turned to my friend Nick. I was like, "Let's just watch it again." It's so funny, and, and so don't believe. I mean, sometimes it's true, but you know, well, don't yeah. necessarily believe it. <laughs> Human beings are so awful to each other. I know, yeah. aren't we? Um, well, listen. Thank you. Wait, Edie, what's your shirt? What's your T-shirt? Uh, the Deadly Spawn. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. oh of course. Yes. That was, you know, uh, you know, yeah, that was uh, Michael Keaton. And, uh, the there is one called Spawn Alone, isn't it? Just Spawn. Spawn, no, yes, but that's, that's a, it's like, I think it's, yes, it's a more, I think so. It's a more superhero one. I think it Fred might. And Jude Law even, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Possibly. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah no, this is quite different. This is a, a very much a, an 80s B movie, which still doesn't have a good UK Blu-ray release. They have in America. <laughs> But, yes, exactly. I mean, both, both of you are incensed for me. Cannot <laughs> believe it. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have any final thoughts on this, Phil, before we uh, sign off? Uh, I damn you, Stevie, once again. And yet, actually, I'm very grateful. And Joe. It was a very fun piece of shit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. exactly. yeah. And uh, that's all you can ask for, I suppose, with shit. <laughs> the hurdle Indeed, you got, Stephen Fry sat for ninety minutes when he could have been, you know, doing a documentary about, uh, some, like, off in Greenland about is something important. And I, hope just, you, I hope we get to do this again with another movie. Yes. Absolutely, we'll make it a deal. Absolutely, I, 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 I'll cook again. I would love to do it. Yeah. Well, there you go. Next season, we'll be that back. That would be a real pleasure, yes. Bad Moon is curated by Stevie Webb. Tally ho! Go awesome bits or whatever it is. <laughs> Thank you all very, very much. Thank real you good. for having me, you. and I, lo- I really would love to do it again. 
Well, there we go. Season two is donezo. Thank you so much to Stephen and Joel for joining me to see out the show in spectacular fashion. And thank you to all my guests who have joined me this season. Elijah Wood, Louise Blaine, Tori Allen Martin, Mike Munzer, Becky Dark, Roshane and Erica, aka Homies of Horror, Prano Bailey Bond, Cody Jameson Strand, Kim Morrison, Brad Hansen, Joshua Tonks, Stuart Burnside, Matt Lucas, Sean Sean Parkins, Dino Fetcher, Julie Atherton, James Graham OBE, Anna Bogotskaya, Emily Head, Sonny Mabry, Andrew Hunter Murray, and Dan Schreiber. Wow, what an incredible fucking lineup. Uh, I don't see how I can possibly match that in season three, but I'll give it a go. Once again, if you'd like to access regular bonus content until we're back, just head to our Patreon page. If you'd like to stay in touch socially on Twitter and Letterboxd, it's Stevie's Brain Rot on Facebook and Instagram, it's Brain Rot Pod. If you'd like to email me, it's Stevie's Brain Rot at gmail.com. Or you can get some merch at Stevie's Brain Rot.com. I think that's everything. So, for the last time, Rotters, for season two, toodles! And I have to tell you now, Stevie, you can cut this out, but I've only just <laughs> remembered to press record on the sound. It'll be fine. <laughs> Ha 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 ha!